Aloha, everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Trauma Recovery University. I am your host, Athena Moberg, and I have along with me, of course, my amazing co-host, Bobby Parrish, and today's topic is procrastination abuse survivors and procrastination specifically. If this is your first time tuning in to our video broadcast, we would like to say thank you for being one of our loyal viewers or listeners or subscribers or just awesome survivors. And we invite you to share this with as many of your friends you think would help. And you can have complimentary access as our thank you for tuning in today to all of our library our entire library of downloadable resources. And you can find that by going to traumarecoveryuniversity.com and clicking on the tab that says downloadables. You can also find it by going to nomoreshameproject.com and clicking on downloadables as well. If you are listening on a podcast platform such as iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, we want to welcome you and thank you for tuning in and listening. This is a video broadcast. And it's way more fun when you get to watch us talk with our hands and have conversations. And uh, so we want to invite you to find us over on our YouTube channel or on our Roku TV channel. And you can find us by searching for Trauma Recovery University. And also, as always, this is an interactive broadcast. So we take your questions. We, uh, we invite you to tune in live and send us your tweets. We monitor the hashtag on Twitter no more shame. You can ask us questions, let us know you're tuning in, or just say hello to us 24 hours a day, seven days a week by using the hashtag no more shame, and we'll end up finding it. My Twitter handle is Athena Moberg, and Bobby Parrish's Twitter handle is Truth Is Hers. You have questions for this broadcast or comments, please tweet us using the hashtag no more shame. And without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Bobby for some uh, housekeeping items and announcements. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Athena. Uh, we're so honored that you're here, and we know that you have a busy week, a busy life, and we're very thankful that you choose to spend an hour of your week with us, whether it's watching us now while we're live or um, tuning in later on Yahoo. Yahoo, where'd that come from? YouTube <laughs> or Roku TV. So thank you very much, and I wanted to let everyone know that all those submissions have stopped for our anthology. Yesterday was the last day to send in your submission for the No More Shame Project anthology that will come out in November of 2015. It is never too early to start thinking about submitting for next year's anthology. Every year during November, which we have labeled No More Shame November as a month when we advocate for survivors of childhood abuse and create awareness for the large numbers out there that of people who have been abused. Um, one in four girls and one in six boys are abused when they're under the age of 18. So they're just huge numbers. And during that No, no More Shame November, we put out an anthology. And so last year was our first one. This one that's gonna be coming up this November will be our second. And then uh, beginning the first of the year, so, uh, June 2016, we'll start accepting submissions for the new anthology for November 2016. So yeah, get them January, ready. Right? Jan January, right? January through June, I think. Right? right? Yes. 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 Um, it's also not too soon to think about buying your copy of the 2015 No More Shame Project Anthology. And our publisher this year is Booktrope, and we will be letting you know more about where you can buy it and when, when we have more details. Um, also want to let you know that Athena and I both have books coming out. Um, my memoir, Fly Away Girl, and then a book I'm writing out, Healing from Abuse, called Healing After Abuse, will both be out this year. And Athena's book, Aloha for the Soul, will also be out this year. So keep your eyes peeled and we will give you more information when we have it on when the books will be out and how you can make one your very own. I also want to let people know it is May, June 1st. I'm still stuck in May. It's June 1st, and I am opening up my Recovery Accelerator small group program. 
And the first group meeting will be on June 11th, Thursday, June 11th. Um, so it's only the second time that I've opened it. And so if you're interested, go to my website, bobbyparish.com and click on the work with me tab and all the information is there. So that's all I can think of Athena with the exception of giving out, um, letting people know that this uh, presentation tonight will very well be triggering for you, especially if you yourself are a survivor of childhood abuse. Uh, we know that sometimes we get partners um, of people who have been abused. Sometimes we get mental health professionals that watch these shows. So if you're a survivor, this may be triggering for you. And we want to make sure that you know how to contact our friends at RAIN, R-A-I-N-N, um, if you're in the United States, you can reach them at 1-800-656-HOPE, H-O-P-E. If you are international, then you can reach them at their website, RAIN, R-A-I-N-N dot org, and they have a 24-7 crisis chat line that you can access. So I think that's all I have to throw out there. Athena, are there any other public service announcements that we need to make? Actually, I just wanted to mention, um, thank you, by the way, Susan, for your awesome tweets. I want to welcome and say hello to anyone that is watching live right now in the UK. It is 2 o'clock in the morning, and you guys are such just, you're amazing. You're rock stars. I can't even believe that you're awake at 2 in the morning to watch us and to talk with us and to tweet with us. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to say hello to our viewers that could be viewing live up in Victoria, Canada. And I also want to say hello to our new viewers in Italy and Spain and Portugal. And, of course, all of you amazing U.S. folks that have been here for a year and a half. So um, we love you guys. You're the reason we do this every single week. Every single topic on our editorial calendar was given to us by you. You are the one. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And... I wanted to make one more announcement, and I'm going to put my phone down and just look into your eyes and just say something to you guys, okay? So um, this coming weekend, which is June 6th, this was supposed to be the weekend that I was going to be having my live event in Atlanta. And it's hard for me to look at you when I'm saying this because it's quite emotional, so I'm going to look up if that's okay. Um, the death of my father has rattled me a little bit or a lot more than I had anticipated and in an effort to maintain integrity with myself and with each of you, I want to just let you know that I have not canceled my event. I have just postponed it and I will be informing you guys another time when I am a little bit more composed. Uh, when my event will be postponed too, and I haven't forgot about you, and it's not that I meant to switch it up on you and rip the rug out from underneath you or change my plans and all of that. I just didn't know that I would be as affected as I am, and I didn't know that my dad was going to die. So um, my... Uh, some of my family members have been really wonderful and they've been an incredible support as have many of you and as have you Bobby and my husband of course has been wonderful other people that were in my family unfortunately were not a source of support whatsoever they were actually a source of pain and making my father's death exponentially more painful than it had to be due to their lack of support and their selfishness and their inability to be compassionate. So um, thank you for your patience and your compassion in um, helping me to just heal from this. It's Grief is a difficult thing and trauma is cumulative. So just as my son enlisting in the military and getting deployed triggered all kinds of old trauma from my childhood, um, the death of my father is also very triggering to everything, rewinding it all the way back. So um, I'm here, I'm showing up, I'm present. I just, I was not able to follow through with my commitment to you and to myself in keeping the live event for June 6th because I felt like I was falling apart and I didn't feel that rah-rah 
being excited about my event and I wasn't able to be authentically me. Um, it wasn't the way I had imagined my event would, would turn out. Um, and so I chose to postpone it rather than shame myself into keeping that commitment. So I invite you to do the same or maybe post in the comments below if you've ever had a situation where you've had to release yourself from a commitment due to some pressures or situations. I would love to hear what you have to say. Your comments mean the world to me. Thank you for the emails, the tweets, um, the Facebook posts and messages and everything. So a bit of a, a long um, rant there, Bobby, but I, th I thought that it was really necessary that I address that I w I'm not following through with the commitment that I had made to everybody. Well, but the thing that I want to point out is that you have followed through with the biggest commitment of all, which is to you and your own recovery. Um, yes, the event is getting postponed, but how many of us as survivors have not yet learned how to take care of ourselves? how to put ourselves first when it's necessary. Um, yeah, we grew up with people who put themselves first every, pardon my French, damn day of the week. Um, and they were always first, and we were always, you know, at the bottom of the heap. And so learning how to put ourselves first when it's necessary is a really, really hard thing to do. And so um, you have kept your commitment. And one of the things that you and I have been committed to doing, Athena, from the beginning is walking our talk. And if we neglect ourselves in effort to, you know, we, we neglect our grief in an effort to put on an event simply because we had said, you know, we were going to, um, that's disingenuous. And I don't ever want any of you to feel that we are disingenuous. It is a huge thing for us to let you know that we are in recovery too. And sometimes things are just hard. As much as Athena and I, as far as we have progressed in our recovery, some things still hit us upside the head and throw us for a loop. And I don't think there's a single person in the world um, with the exception of perhaps the people you have referenced in terms of your family, um, who would fault you for being thrown for a loop by your father's death. Um, we did a hangout um, months ago on how to handle um, the death of an abuser. And I know that your father was not your abuser, but he was integrally enmeshed with the people in your life during the period when you went through your abuse and so that that makes it really hard and so um, I'm thankful that you're taking the time to take care of yourself to heal to handle your business so that when you tell us to handle our business um, you're not talking out of both sides of your mouth you know what I mean I do. I do. Thank you for acknowledging me, Bobby, and for acknowledging um, just how hard it is sometimes to be a survivor that is um, passionate and entrepreneurial and a family person and a wife and a, and a, a cousin and a friend and an aunt. And I'm, I'm a, I wear a different million different hats every day, just like all of you do. And when you throw death into the mix, or as I have been referring to it lately, dead people stuff. Dead people stuff is a lot harder than live people stuff, just FYI, peeps. Um, take care of yourself, be gentle with yourself when a death arises. And yes, as Bobby mentioned, my father was not my abuser, but I didn't realize until recently that I had some feelings deep down um, of, of bitterness, and I felt almost betrayed by my dad. And um, I was able to say all these things to him as I sat by his bedside for the last 16 days of his life and just share with him my my feelings and my concerns and my frustrations. And I wasn't frustrated with him or bitter toward him because he abused me. On the contrary, my dad spanked me one time my entire life. And that one time he ever spanked me, he sat me down on his lap about 10 minutes later and he apologized to me with tears in his eyes. And he said, 
I never want you to experience being punished out of anger in my home because you you experience that daily where you live. So I hope you'll forgive me. Yeah. And, and I do. I forgive him for that. That wasn't what I felt bitter about. No. I think what I felt bitter about is that he didn't, although he drove week after week after week, month after month, year after year to rescue me in the middle of the night, he never followed through and rescued me for good. Rescued you for good. Right. Yeah. I, I still always had to go back. And I, as a child, you don't understand why. Why do I have to keep going back? And I would just beg the sheriff and I would beg the authorities. And they, they just thought that I was just being a child. They didn't understand. So um, I didn't realize that I was bitter toward my dad until the end. And um, I'm glad that I got a chance to spend the last 16 days of his life with him and, and love on him and read to him and pray with him and sit with him and take pictures of him every day. I have pictures every single day of his progress and stuff and um, just talk with him and speak my heart. And um, I don't have any regrets at all regarding yes. my dad. Zero, zero, zero regrets. And that feels good. So I recommend that. And I think that's why I brought up the event, you guys, because I do regret not following through with my commitment to you by hosting that live event so that you all could meet me in person and all you people that have sent me these emails and amazing things like, I want to meet you in person. I can't wait to hang out with you. Oh my gosh, it's going to be amazing. And then to have me disappoint you like this, I felt really bad. But on, on the other hand, I am so grateful for your support and your encouragement and your understanding and your compassion. Um, and understanding that this is something that I just needed to push the pause button on life for a minute, gather myself, and um, move confidently and courageously forward in my journey. And yes, in, and in make such, yourself a priority. Yeah, which that's hard. You all know if you're a survivor, it's really hard to make yourself a priority. But I promise you that when I have more details about the event in September, um, I do know one thing. It is going to be in Alabama this time instead of Atlanta, Georgia, because I've been given an opportunity to speak at the Rossbridge Resort, which is a beautiful property in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, I do know that that is where it will be held, so write that down if you're interested in meeting me or hearing me speak, hearing um, a little bit more of my story, and um, have a couple surprises with some keynote speakers. And um, But I promise you that the wait is worth it because I'm a different person now than I was prior to my dad's death. A very different person. I'm a lot more resilient, as Bobby has pointed out. <laughs> yes, yes. So um, I'm I'm thankful for all of you as you stand um, with us as Athena makes this healing journey that she needs to make and she is choosing to make. Um, because that is so much what recovery is like. Um, sometimes we go into it kicking and screaming um, but because some life circumstance has thrown us into it. But the reality is that it is a choice. Every damn day it is a choice. Every day you get up and you say, I choose to recover today. I choose to do the hard work. I choose to make a commitment to taking care of myself. Um, and it's not easy. And especially not easy when you lose a parent. So, um, Although it feels a little bit like procrastination because I'm not showing up at that event this weekend. Perfect segue. Although it feels well, you like know. I'm procrastinating, I'm really not. <laughs> I swear, I swear, I swear, I swear, I am not procrastinating, really. <laughs> <laughs> but really quick before we segue, I wanted to bring up, um, you were talking a lot about triggers. And I want to make sure that all of you know that we recognize how huge triggers can be in the life of a survivor. And so as we speak, Athena and I are working on putting together a trigger toolkit. Uh, we talked about it last week a bit in our um, 
our hangout and our chats and we are going to have that up for you on the Trauma Recovery University website within the next couple of weeks because it is so important for all of us to be prepared to deal with triggers before you get in the middle of that situation that is triggering and your executive functioning goes to heck in the handbasket. So we want to provide you with that toolkit. It'll be up on the website in the next couple of weeks and it will help you uh, deal with triggers as they come because they will come whether you are prepared for them or not. And we yeah. would much rather you be prepared than you be smacked upside the head and be floundering. Yeah, um, and I want to add yeah. something about this trigger toolbox, Bobby. Okay. I want to I want to point out that ever since we have told you guys about this trigger toolbox, we've gotten suggestions from you as to what to put in it, and we're taking every single email and tweet and Facebook private message. We're taking them to heart, and we've done all kinds of research. We spent hours on Skype the other day doing a business, like a planning meeting regarding this trigger toolkit, just impromptu. It was awesome. And in addition to it having incredible content and tactics for you to employ immediately and options for your trigger toolkit, it's going to be so beautiful. I'm making it so pretty. I'm hand making all of the graphics for you. I'm so excited. Okay, we can move on now. <laughs> okay, so look for that. And Athena is right. Um, being a survivor, it's it's so important that we understand what procrastination is all about. Before we went live, Athena and I were talking about the comments that we used to hear when we were a child about procrastination. And it was always a put in the framework of we're bad. Um, what is taking you so long? What's wrong with you? What's what is wrong, wrong with, with you? Isn't that not the worst thing to say to a small child? Because you're obviously implying there's something wrong with them. And that in itself is a shaming statement. Well, so you're not saying, you're not even saying what you are doing is wrong. Let me help you fix it. You're saying, what is wrong with you? Which causes the child to go, I didn't know there was something wrong with me. Let me think about it. What's wrong with me? Oh, maybe everything's wrong with me. Wait, could it be this? Could it be this? Could it be that? You're a child. You don't know. Right. Off, you know, and then one, one of the people, Bobby, during chat, I want you to elaborate on this. They said that they heard from one of their abusers, and I can resonate with this. This happened to me. They would hover, criticize, and then say, forget it. I'll do it myself. Yes. <laughs> because obviously, the, the implication is, because obviously, you can't do it. Um, and... You know, you can't do it along with a million judgments about how terrible you are. And it just goes into that pile of horrible things that have been said to us about who we are. And that's shame. And it piles up and it piles up and it piles up and it piles up. And I know that, you know, we have people all the time who say to us, why can't you just get over it? But I guarantee that if you are a survivor, and you can see in your head that horrific pile of shame and judgment that we had when we were children. I'm not talking about heaping shame and judgment on an adult. I'm talking about telling a three and four year old child that they are worthless or they're bad or they're never going to be able to do anything good or everything they do is bad. That's the kind of thing that weaves into your very soul, that becomes part of the tapestry of who you are. Um, and so, of course, when we get older and we procrastinate about something, we hear those tapes, those judgments in our head. What's the matter with you? Why can't you do it? Why are you so slow? Why do you always wait until the last minute? What's the matter with you? Um, all of that for us is a shame trigger and it leaves us feeling even more worthless perhaps than we were before we started going into the project but the reality is and this is what we really want to, you to hear us say 
that procrastination for survivors, for the most part, yes, some of us, you know, there's one or two people in, in every bunch who would rather play games on their Nintendo than work on projects they have to work on. That's not what we're talking about. For us, procrastination is a coping technique. And it is an avoidance technique. Avoidance is a coping strategy. And the reason that we avoid completing these tasks is because we are anxious about what the project will look like when it's finished and how people will receive it. Because chances are high that we have a low self-worth. And we are honestly anxious about what the project will look like when it's done and how others will receive it. Will they be yet one more person who says, are you kidding me? This, this is what you did? This is horrible. I can't believe you took all this time. You had, you had months and months and this is the stuff that you give me? Um, I realize it sound, might sound extreme to some of you, especially if you're not a survivor, but I tell you, those are the kinds of things that go through our head when we're worrying about tackling a task or a project. I hear those voices that you just said all the time. Those are the voices yeah. that go through my head when I'm trying to work. I'm trying to do something amazing. I'm trying to launch a new product or I'm doing all this incredible work with survivors and you wanna know what I hear in my head? I hear the voice you just talked about or I hear someone else in my family who says this so perfectly. Gosh, you just must feel so horrible. You must feel like such a horrible person because your husband works so hard and he's so stressed out and you don't make enough money. You must feel like a horrible person. <laughs> and I know that it's, it's so ludicrous that it's almost funny, but not yeah, really. <laughs> that's, you know, that's the kind of messages that we have been sent from the people in our lives who instead were supposed to build us up and protect us and take care of us. Um, you know, and last week we talked about how when we're triggered by news stories and the message that we interpret when we see a news story about a victim not being protected is that it triggers in us that belief that we too weren't worthy of being protected. And so, we know these messages and it comes down again here's that wicked visitor of low self-worth we talked about it last week we're talking about it this week and i guarantee to you that as we talk about other topics low self-worth will come up time and time again and that's because self-worth and the fact that we don't believe we have any worth is one of the primary lies that our abuse and our abusers tell us. It's how they keep us down. It's how they keep us isolated. It's how they keep us from telling our story. Um, and so here we are one more time talking about a topic that at its root is actually about self-worth. Yes, other people who are not survivors procrastinate all the time. Um, earlier today, Athena and I were doing a um, Google Hangout for entrepreneurs about the topic of procrastination. And Athena did a Google search to demonstrate um, how quickly and how many results come up on Google when you type in the word procrastination. I am going and to it, look it up right now while you're talking and then I'm going to interrupt you again. Okay. Um, and it's amazing, yes, other people deal with procrastination, absolutely. It's not something that as survivors we own, it's all our own. But we are more susceptible to procrastination because of our low self-worth, because of our anxiety issues that we might carry. Um, PTSD is an anxiety disorder. And also because we're prone to setting a standard for ourselves as nothing less than perfection. Sometimes that's because that was the standard that was set for us when we were children. Nothing less than perfect was acceptable to our abusers or the dysfunctional family members that we shared our home with. 
Um, and of course, you can't be perfect. So obviously then we never met the standard and obviously then our self-worth is going to be nothing. And it's just this lovely little horrible, vicious circle. Um, and yeah. now, now here we are as adults trying to earn our worth by being perfect. And once again, of course, we can't be perfect. So we go through the same circle one more time. We can't be perfect. We feel terrible. We can't be perfect. We feel worse. We can't be perfect. We feel even worse. And it's just a nasty, slippery, sliding slope. Um, I have the results from that, from that search. I invite you right now, survivors of uh, incredible things. You go to Google and you type in the word procrastination. Next time you feel alone in your procrastination, type it into Google and you will get 11 million 900 and something thousand results for the word procrastination, articles that have been written on procrastination, and all of that will happen in 0 0.3 seconds. Fun fact. Three tenths of a second. Google, you are amazing. Um, <laughs> but it can't, it's a testament to how prevalent an issue that it is. It's also a testament to how gnarly the issue is because if it were an easy thing to solve, there wouldn't be that many articles on it. Um, so I think as survivors, when we take it apart and we recognize that procrastination is a coping technique to deal with our anxiety about not putting out a product or a project or whatever it is that we're supposed to be doing that meets other people's standards and that maybe meets our own standards, everyone will easily understand why as survivors we're more prone to that and where it comes from. So. Um, this morning in chat. In fact, but even before chat, I know a couple days ago we had people saying, I don't understand why we're talking about this. What does it have to do with being a survivor? And then once we unpacked it a little bit, which makes sense to me. I mean, I think until I unpacked the topic for myself, I wouldn't have chosen it as a topic for a survivor chat. But once you look at it, then you can understand why it applies. Yeah. Did you think I was crazy when I wanted to use it as a topic? <laughs> no, but I didn't think you were crazy. I never think you're crazy. Um, <laughs> we're all a little crazy. <laughs> well, we all are, not just us survivors. Um, and those of us who are a little crazy have a whole lot of fun. So. I didn't think you were crazy, but I didn't understand the relationship until I looked at it um, and started doing some research. You and then know, it made perfect sense. You want to know how I thought, how I got the idea for this topic for a chat? Well, because you guys know that you are the ones that give us all the ideas. Well, I have a friend who lives here locally on the island of Maui, and um, we get together often. Um, we sometimes holiday together, and uh, we are we're we're good friends, and we're both survivors. And when um, we were together hanging out here at my house one time, we got on the topic, and it was it was like a light bulb for me. I was like, you know what? Like I'm not alone. And then I asked a couple other people. And then I got some messages about it. And it was like, you know what? This is definitely something. And we really wanted to, to um, open up our line of topics. You know, we don't want it to only feel like, you know, oh, well, you know, very few people can relate to this. We take your guys' examples that you give us, your requests. We reframe them occasionally. Like I got some private face, uh, private Twitter messages the other day about a certain topic, and we're going to reword it or reframe it a bit, and we're definitely going to delve into that topic moving forward. But we take all of your suggestions seriously, and I'm so happy, Bobby, that, that we were able to, to choose this topic because the conversation this morning, if you were to sum it all up when we were doing our, our – um, international chat that's for our UK audience that is um, 11 or 12 or 13 hours ahead of me and I can't, I can't remember exactly but they're in Greenwich Mean Time and so the overarching feeling of chat today I would have to say personally just from my own personal observation was oh my gosh I do that too me too I do that this is me you just described me no way me too wait 
oh my gosh, that was said to you? Those things were said to me. Wait, and, and then more than one time it was, I think that was a light bulb moment for me. Wait a second, what you just said, what you just said unlocked a piece to the puzzle for me. Wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Me too, me too, me too. And that was how it was this morning. And so whenever we yeah. have that go on, Bobby, I just, I just, I can't help but just jump for joy when we yeah. have that kind of stuff going. Because I think that most of us have been sold the bill of goods that procrastination is a character flaw. But it's not. It's a coping technique. There's a reason why we do it. And when we know the reason, and you and I have talked about this before, and I think it's so true. When we don't understand something, it has more power. When we demystify it, when we pull it apart and we understand it and we know where it comes from and how all the gears fit together and what gives it power, then we can disassemble it. Then we can remove the source of power. And suddenly it's not this big hairy beast anymore. It's, you know, a labradoodle who just needs a really good grooming. Um, so I think that is something of what, at least from my perspective, that I saw in this morning's chat was people going, wait a minute, you know, I was always told that this was what was wrong with me. But now that I understand that it has to do with, you know, my self-worth and anxiety, now I can fix it because I can tackle those underlying issues. Um, and perhaps some people got the permission that they needed to let go of stringent, expectations about deadlines. We had that this morning, which I thought was very interesting. People saying, you know, my therapist told me I need to procrastinate more. And the message the therapist was trying to tell them was to let themselves take a breath if they needed to take a breath. Um, we have someone in our Twitter chat who has chronic pain due to a physical condition. And she said she was trying to come to terms with the fact that sometimes during the day she needed to lay down in order to alleviate her pain. But she had felt that she was just wasting her time and that she was using that to procrastinate. But the reality is that that for her is good self-care. So procrastination in and of itself is not an evil thing. And it is not something born of our personal flaws. It's something we do. It's a coping technique under the category of avoidance that we do in order to protect ourselves from feeling like a failure, which is probably the, one of the main messages we got when we were kiddos. So, What's wrong with you? What's wrong, what's wrong with, you? with you? Hurry up, well, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. What's wrong with you? You know, I think by the time I was 13, I probably could have given you a list a mile long, eh? Of mm -hmm. the things that were wrong with me. Because I had certainly been told all of them. Yeah. Um, we have an awesome one page, you guys. Uh, we compile this data throughout the week. We do research on these topics that you give us. And then Bobby types everything out and gives me blurbs and gives me a beautifully formatted uh, document with all of the information. I go in and I do some aesthetic touches to it format it on our proprietary letterhead that's digital, and we make it available to you, the listener or viewer or awesome survivor, just as a thank you for tuning in. And so if that's you and you're seeing us on Roku TV or YouTube or you're listening on a podcast platform such as iTunes, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or iHeartRadio, then please go to traumarecoveryuniversity.com and click on the tab that says Downloadables you will be given immediate access not only to tonight's one page, which is titled Abuse Survivors or Trauma Survivors and Procrastination, but you'll be given access to our entire library of downloadable resources, PDF one pages, that are designed specifically for you to feel better today, not 20 years from now after you finish therapy and recovery and everything else. So, um, we, uh, we are pleased to offer this to you, and we do have a very important part at the very end in red because we do not want you to be suffering unnecessarily. So without further ado, Bobby is going to screen share, and we're going to dive into today's one-page resource titled Abuse Survivors and Procrastination. You bet. And the reason that we do these, like Athena said, is that the purpose for them is to give you 
Let me see if I can make it big now. Boom. Oh, I have to go up. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> there we go. Um, our purpose is to provide you with some education about the topic, and that's what these first three paragraphs are. And then we provide you with some actionable strategies and tips you can do, like Athena said, today to feel better. Um, Athena and I, again, are both survivors. Both of us have had recovery periods that extended over multiple decades, and we want to change that for you. We want your recovery to be simpler, not easy, but simpler and quicker. And so we have put together all of this information in an effort to empower you and give you the information and knowledge you need to accelerate your recovery. So these first three paragraphs talk about um, what I lost you, Bobby. I can't hear you anymore. I think you might have touched the mute button. I do that there all the are. time. I lean okay. on my mute button. Thank oh, you. Oh, that's Thank okay. You. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Just uh, start, start back over at the top. Okay. Um, the first paragraph talks about that procrastination is not a character flaw. It is a, typically an avoidance technique, a coping technique that we use to deal with our anxiety and doubts about our self-worth. So again, we would rather be seen as someone who doesn't meet a deadline than someone who turns out a terrible product or a terrible project. Um, that most people deal with procrastination at one time or another in their lives. Um, like Athena showed us with that quick and huge Google search. But that it's particularly difficult for survivors because we already have anxiety and self-worth issues set into us by our abuse. And then you set into that, so we have anxiety, we have issues about our self-worth, and then the dreaded perfectionism, which I know Athena and I have talked about several times that we need to do um, a hangout about that, and we will get that on the calendar, um, and I'll remember that. <laughs> but when you combine those three, um, that just makes procrastination, as I would say, a very sticky wicket for most survivors. It's not as simple as saying, I'm not going to do that anymore. Um, we have to do a little more work to tackle procrastination and make it something that we don't do anymore. But keep in mind, sometimes postponing a task is healthy. In fact, it's even excellent self-care. Just like Athena talked about earlier when she was talking about how she has had to postpone the live event she was planning that was going to take place this weekend. Postponing that event is not because she's a weak person or she's got character flaws and didn't do what she was supposed to do. It's because she's taking care of herself and she's putting something off because something else is of greater importance right now, and that is her own healing process. So sometimes you too should put off something because something more important has come up. Thank you, Bobby. You're welcome. So let's look at some tips and strategies. The first one, work on increasing your self-worth so that you need to implement procrastination as a coping technique less often. Okay, easier said than done. But when you know that your self-worth is at the core of the reason why you procrastinate, that, that just strips away some of its power. And so when you know that that is there, and hopefully all of us, are continually working on our self-worth because again it's one of those core underlying issues one of those core lies that our abuse tells us the more we work on it the less we will find ourselves turning to procrastination as a coping technique yeah also work to decrease your expectation that you're going to do everything perfectly because that, too, will decrease your need to use procrastination as a coping technique. 
as we find ourselves needing to be perfect less, we will procrastinate less. And the next one, I always see a puzzle in my head when I look at this one, you know, a jigsaw puzzle. Yeah. Break down the task into small parts and start with those that you think are the easiest and that you are most likely to perform well. When I put together a jigsaw puzzle, the first thing I always go for are finding those four corner pieces. It's just my strategy because yeah. once I find those four corner pieces and I compare them to the picture on the box, suddenly I have I have my guideposts. And so that's what I always start with. And of course, finding the four corner pieces, it's not really hard because they look differently than all the other pieces do. So it's the easiest, but it also has a big impact for me. So when you're starting on a task and it's a larger task, break it down into small pieces and start with those that are the easiest for you that are going to give you the most bang for your buck. Because one thing that Athena and I know for sure is that recovery, when it's positively oriented, it gets its own momentum. You know, it's like that small snowball that starts and it gets bigger and more powerful and bigger as it goes. As you start to have success in your project, it will start to have its own momentum to carry forward. Now, I want to make a comment on this particular bullet point down towards the bottom of our one page above the pro tip. And we're talking right now about breaking tasks into small pieces and starting with the ones you think are the easiest and the most likely that you'll perform well. Now, obviously, if you all are listening and you have been, you've been told the opposite of this in every high performance book, in every entrepreneurial book, in every self-help quote, quote, book, or uh, you, you've been told quite the opposite. There's the famous quote. You know, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? And then there's the other one, like, what do you tackle first in the morning? You, you, I think it's called like tackle the, tackle the tiger yeah. or, or tackle the, the first. Yeah. Like always tackle the hardest thing first. But I want to make a comment here um, to tag on the post that I put on Facebook today. And that is if you're struggling with a mental illness due to any type of um, prolonged latent effects of, that's been caused by your child abuse, your executive functioning could be affected and you could struggle with anxiety that is disproportionate to the task that you are getting ready to tackle. Yes. Yes. I want to say, say that again. If you are currently struggling with or could possibly be struggling with a mental illness that is that has been caused by latent effects from your child abuse your executive functioning could be affected and your level of anxiety is disproportionate to the task you are about ready to tackle that was a mouthful but i just did that off the cuff off the top of my head so i want you to know right now that there's no shame in not doing what all those books tell you to do. Yes, they, they might be right. Yes, uh, that might work best for that author. But you know what we always tell you. You know what's best in your recovery. Recovery is not a one size fits all. It's not a one and done. It's not a bullet uh, bullet point or, or a, what do you call that? Like a template that is one size fits all. Right, recovery right. is not one size fits all. It's not a pattern like a dress where you can just you know, it, what, what, whatever dress fits this woman will fit that woman or that woman or that woman. It's just not <laughs> like that. Recover, we all know that's not true. I definitely do not wear that size dress. So, um, so y'all, what I'm trying to say is that just because you've been told your whole life that in order to succeed and perform at your highest level, you have to tackle the hardest tasks first, Bobby and Athena are giving you permission to not do that because you might be struggling. And once you do a couple of things that you know you can do that are gonna turn out great and they're the smaller tasks that might be a little bit less detailed or tedious, you're gonna feel fantastic about yourself and it's gonna be yep. self-perpetuating and you're gonna be yep. like, oh my gosh, I accomplished so much. So I'll stop rambling now, but I really wanted to put that in there because you've been told the opposite for so, 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 so long 
that you could be like, what? These people are Pinocchio's. They are telling us the opposite. They are lying. And we're not lying. We're telling you right now that those people that wrote those books were being honest with you. That's their strategy that works for them. And we, like them, are being honest with you. This is what strategy works for us and our clients who are trauma survivors. End rant. <laughs> I love your rants. <laughs> so, so the next bullet point I think is so important. Um, that is to partner with safe people who provide you with both accountability and positive reinforcement. Mm. I know that as survivors, we are so used to going it alone um, because being in relationship with other people has typically been so painful for us, both emotionally and physically, that we don't really like to be in relationship with other people. And so dealing with that and then heaping on all the shame from our childhood and probably some of our adulthood because we made mistakes because of our childhood, um, we can be very people who isolate a whole lot. But I want to tell you that when you are trying to kick procrastination to the curb, one of the best things you can do for yourself is to find a safe person to partner with who you can go to and say, okay, look, I'm working on this project and can you just look at it and give me some feedback and when you get that positive feedback it really continues the momentum it really helps even if it's something as simple as I know a couple of um, several weeks ago we dealt with the top was back in April because it was when you were here Athena we were talking about um, hygiene this was the one about the mail and I'm trying to remember what the topic was and so many of us were talking about how we had a hard time dealing with the mail yeah and how I used to I throw it in the trunk of my car yeah um and that it I, I don't remember what the topic was but when you know so okay so the task I'm gonna set for myself is every day I'm gonna get the mail I'm gonna open everything I'm gonna throw away was junk mail and I'm going to if it's not junk mail I'm gonna deal with it at that moment rather than setting it someplace to pile up and bite me in the hiney later <laughs> that's when is the perfect time to have a partner who can say to you hey did you get the mail today um, how'd you do hey wow great sounds like you did well and I, I know I've said that in kind of a corny voice but when you're really struggling with something getting positive reinforcement um, that is genuine and true that's why you need a safe person you need someone who's not out there to make you feel worse um, it can be so important and so really do look for someone who's going to be your cheerleader and who's going to reinforce the fact that you are putting effort in trying to make a change in your life. So. I love that, Bobby. And it is so, so true. We all need people who are, who are supporters of us. And on, our, yeah. on a previous broadcast that Bobby and I were recording just a moment ago, I was sharing that I have a business coach. I have a... a leading purpose strategist performance coach and yet she is completely compassionate and as my homework one week she told me to go get Chinese food give myself a facial and watch a movie because she was like Athena Athena you are a high performer you are an overachiever have you even given yourself permission to grieve the, the loss of your father have you even paused a minute for you when was the last time you took some time out for you now yes she's my business coach yes she's like uh athena you had this 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 and this that you said you were going to have done how far are you on that task list let's talk about that let's tackle it what can i help you with how can i best support you in that task list today yes she's going to be that person but she's also going to be someone who knows me and who who is looking out for what's best for me and if you're wondering who she is, her name is Lady J. That's her nickname. Her name is Dr. Javana Ellison. And she wrote an awesome book called You Have What It Takes. 
And Bobby and I are trying to put together a resource list where you all can just uh, click from our website and read the books that we think are amazing that we recommend to our clients. And the more and more I read of this book, the more it will probably be on our resource list because it is filled with um, great support for anyone, not just trauma survivors, but people who uh, just people who are human. That means you. I, there it's you just, go. That's right. Yeah. Like, yeah, you qualify because you're human. And I know we're running out of time here, and we're going to be um, we're going over uh, the end of our one-page resource. But I want to just quickly mention during our chat this morning, and it will likely happen again tomorrow, there was a phrase that was used over and over and over again uh, by a couple of people, and that is, I find it hard to know what is me that is just me, the person, and what is me, the person that is the abuse survivor? Is this character trait or personality trait or thing that I do, is it because of my abuse? Or is it just because I'm human? Because not all things are abuse related. Right. And this per procrastination is one that falls under you being human. Everyone in the world procrastinates because everyone gets anxious and sort of pauses and hesitates on tackling those things that we know we should. So um, we'll, we'll go further into that. That's, that's something that's been brought up several times. I have a feeling we're going to end up recording like a, some sort of uh, online course or something like with a workbook that you can sort of go through like what, what is me and what is my abuse or something. Right. You know, you know, I struggle with that one sometimes in my parenting. And I have to ask someone, is this something that all parents struggle with? Or is this something I struggle with because I'm a survivor? And so it's just a reality. Sometimes we have to, we have to ask. And I'm, you know, I'm glad that people ask rather than just wonder. Um, our pro tip here on the page is to keep track of the tasks you do complete rather than only a running list of the things you need to do. So, yep, draw a line down the center of that page, one column to do, and the other one done. And my bonus pro tip here is to put things on that list that are a given they're going to go into the done column. For example, on my Monday to-do list are things like do Google Hangout with Athena? Well, guess what? I always do that. I'm always going to do that. We have made a commitment to one another and to you to show up every week. It's going to be a done. I'm going. That's going to be a win. It's always on my list anyway. And it is a because win. it's a win. Yes, win, because win. it's a win, <laughs> and it makes me feel good. So it always goes in the done column. Um, you know, if you have to break it down to making put a cup of coffee or have a cup of coffee on your to-do list because you know that's going to get done. It's going to go over in the other out column. You have my permission to do it. If it helps you feel better, knock yourself out. Um, this last one that we have here in red on the page is very important. And Athena made it red because we want to make sure that we call this to everyone's attention. A lack of motivation is a symptom of depression. So if you have that going on in your life and along with it you have things such as a low mood and it lasts for longer than two weeks, that's actually the diagnostic criteria when you go in and you look at um, in order to make a diagnosis of depression, please talk to your physician because you may be dealing with clinical depression. Yeah. If you know you're clinically depressed, like I have the label of clinical depression, I take antidepressants, I will for the rest of my life, um, then if your lack of motivation, if the, you feel that need to procrastinate despite taking steps to limit it, if it's getting worse, that is the time to call your medical provider and say, hey, I think maybe my depression is getting worse. Yeah, and I want to just, I want to underline this. I, I want to underline it, bold it, italicize it, and disclaimer it 
we are not claiming to be medical physicians. We are not medical doctors. And we are simply saying this to you, the awesome survivor, that if you are struggling with low mood or lack of motivation for longer than two weeks, that's probably an indication that you should reach out to your medical professional, your medical doctor, your psychiatrist, your psychologist, your general practitioner. We are not saying that that is your diagnosis and everyone that experiences that is depressed. We're not throwing around acronyms and buzzwords and, and diagnosing you over Google Hangout, Roku TV, and YouTube. Like, that's not what we're doing. So just disclaimer, we are not claiming that that's what's going on with you. And we are also saying that there is no shame in it. There's no shame in you reaching out and getting the care that you so desperately need and deserve. Deserve so, is the important word. You, do. you deserve it. You do you deserve, deserve it. it. You're worth it. You always so. deserved it. And you weren't always, if you're watching this broadcast, chances are you were abused as a child. And that's pretty much the people that watch this broadcast, whether it was bullying or sexual abuse, physical abuse, religious abuse, cult, uh, you name it, whatever flavor of abuse, emotional, financial, whatever, you're a domestic violence survivor, whatever. You obviously have been through a situation where your needs were not met. Your basic needs for safety, health, food, love, affection, clothing, those are basic needs. And if your basic needs were not met, it is very traumatizing and it can permanently damage your brain. We are not saying that's what's going on, but there is no shame in reaching out just to make sure and just to get the help that you so deserve. You, you deserve to get the proper treatment when you were little. Chances are you're living with something now as a result of not receiving that that proper treatment when you were little. So go get that help that you so deserve and um, keep us posted on your progress. If you are experiencing aha moments and light bulbs, we love getting your emails and we love your comments on the website. I love your voicemails on my website. Um, just please continue to reach out because you guys are the reason that we do all that we do. You guys are the reason we're here. So. Um, I know we have, um, we're going to cut off this broadcast and say thank you for joining us. Bobby has our contact information. If you need our contact information, you can continue to stick around for a little while and watch that. Write that down. Um, or we'll see you next week. Actually, I don't have contact information. Oops, my I bad. have. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> this is we, live. We have the ways that you can connect with us to get more support and um, education and encouragement. Um, and, you know, Athena and I have been bantering back and forth about Twitter and about chats. And if you don't follow us or you have not been following us for a while, you don't know that we have two Twitter chats a week that we lead. And so every week on Monday at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, and that's 6 p.m. in the UK, we have our first Twitter chat of the week. This is our newer Twitter chat, and it was started up because we had an audience in the UK that was large enough that they did not want to have to have a Twitter chat, attend a Twitter chat at 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, so we started that one. The hashtag is CSAQT, Child Sexual Abuse Question Time. And that is on Monday for um, Athena and I. It's in the morning. so. Then we follow that up with on Monday evening at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time or 2 o'clock in the morning on Tuesday. For those of you who are in the UK, we do this Google Hangout that you are either watching live right now or you're watching on YouTube or Roku TV. And then we have our original Twitter chat that is Tuesday nights. And that's at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And again, 2 o'clock in the morning. For those of you in the UK, and the hashtag for that is sex abuse chat, and that is the original um, Twitter chat for child sexual abuse survivors, um, and that is basically ground zero for all of the activities that you see um, Athena and I engaging in now, Trauma Recovery University, um, everything that we do started from that Twitter chat in January 2014. Yeah. And all of these episodes that we're doing now, I think we have um, 42 or 43 now, can be accessed on our YouTube channel. 
24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if you're not sleeping in the middle of the night, you can binge watch yourself, silly. Um, or if you have a Roku TV device, you can watch them on Roku TV. We have multiple secret private Facebook groups, support groups. If you would like to join one of those, we cannot tout being in community with other survivors loudly enough for you. Community is shame's kryptonite. And if you're in community with other survivors, especially the survivors that we have gathered together in these groups, you will be encouraged and supported and loved on to the infinity and beyond, as um, Buzz Lightyear would say. Yes, so. I love Toy Story. Yes, so <laughs> contact us and let us know um, if you would like to join one of them. Um, you can reach me at bobbylparish at gmail.com and you can reach Athena at Athena, Mo Athena at athenamoberg.com, right? Did I say that yeah. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and of course, you can find us at traumarecoveryuniversity.com or no more shame project.com. And remember, guys, No More Shame November is coming up, and the button for your blog is already up there. All you have to do is click on no more shame project.com and find the button that says buttons or pinnables or something. Pinnables, I think. Yeah. And we would love for you to just grab a button. Click and save it. If you need help with that, send us an email. You can always, 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 I can't say always enough times for this, guys. Always reach us via email, no more shame project at gmail.com. If for some reason you haven't reached us at Athena at athenamoberg.com or Bobby L. Parrish at gmail.com. This has been the best broadcast we have ever done. I believe it's been flawless, regardless of the fact that it's live and we have quirks. But we are glad that you're a part of it, and we love our growing community of abuse survivors and people that we can support. So please like this video, share it with all your friends or someone that you think might benefit from it, and tune in next week for another episode of Trauma Recovery University. Aloha. Good night, guys. <laughs>